This is a great day to be a Christian. Turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The title of the lesson this morning is Be Ye Holy. And the principles in our scripture reading this morning are so simple that you'd think that everybody would understand them, but sometimes we don't. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So Titus 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes this. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Robert Fulcham was a writer. He wrote an essay, uh, and he said, Most of what I really need to know about life I learned in kindergarten. And when I was an elementary school teacher, we'd put posters and signs up about some of the things that Robert Fulcham wrote. He said that wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but it was always taught in the sandbox in nursery school. And some of the things he learned were share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt somebody, when you go out into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Now there were several other things in that essay but those things are all pretty basic, aren't they? It's pretty, pretty simple stuff. Don't you think that this world would be a better place if everybody would just do those things that they should have learned to do in nursery school? They should have learned to do those things in kindergarten. And as we read over the scripture this morning, Paul's telling Titus that the things that he needs to be telling everybody were pretty simple things. He told them, exercise self-control. Don't steal, don't lie, don't gossip, don't get drunk. Uh, obey those that are in authority over you. Be good workers in the workplace. Love your family. Uh, you could preach an entire sermon on each one of those points, but you really shouldn't have to because those are things that Christians should just know that that's how they're supposed to live. Those are the things they're supposed to do. I mean, there's so simple that everybody should understand that's what's involved in leading a Christmas, a Christian life. Uh, one of my favorite comic strips was Dilbert. I don't know if you read Dilbert in the comics or not, but Dilbert's always pointing out the absurdity in things. In one of the comic strips, Dilbert decided he was going to start a discount religion. He said that his religion was only going to charge 5% instead of tithing and he was going to allow people to do whatever kind of sin they wanted to. He thought that that would attract a lot of people. He said the only problem with that is that 
I wouldn't want to be part of any kind of church that those people would be attracted to. If you're drawn to something because it's cheap and you can do whatever you want to, that's not what religion is supposed to be about. Religion, Christianity especially, is supposed to be about morality. It's supposed to be about living a life that would be attractive to other people, uh, that people would want to be part of what we have, that want to be part of what we teach. Uh, and that should come naturally. You'd understand if you're going to be a Christian, you should be like Christ. But it's not always easy, apparently. Because Paul told Titus to teach these things where? In the churches. He told him to teach these things to Christians, to people that were supposed to already know how to live. Well, because Christians sometimes forget. We fail to live the lives that we know we're supposed to live. And there's some reasons for that. A survey was conducted among young people, and it asked them uh, what they felt about Christians and Christianity. Here were some of the responses. Christians go about things in an unchristian manner. Somebody else said, Christians have forgotten the point of what it means to be a Christian. Now, third answer was, Christianity has gotten off track with the teachings of Jesus. In other words, people that are Christians are not acting any differently from people that are not Christians. Uh, that's not how it's supposed to be. So why do Christians not act like Christians? Well, I can think of a couple reasons. Number one, we live in a pagan world. We live in a world that's sinful. We live in a world that's pretty bad. Those of us who are older can think back, it didn't used to be this way. Some people say that we live in some of the worst times for morality in all of history. But do we really? I mean, where was Titus preaching? Titus was preaching on the Isle of Crete. Who lived on the Isle of Crete? Cretans. What do we call people that are terrible sinners today? We call them Cretans. Cretans became associated with anybody that was vulgar, anybody that was nasty, anybody that was sorry was called a Cretan. That's the people that Titus was living around. That's the people that the Christians in Titus' time had to deal with. Titus chapter 1, verse 12, Paul wrote this. Uh, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You see, the people that Titus was preaching to were living among pagans. They were living among notorious pagans. They were living among people that were famous for being pagans. Everybody showed disrespect for authority. Everybody lived in a pagan culture, and when you live in a pagan culture, you tend to to fudge a little bit. When you're surrounded by people that tell dirty jokes, you tend to to snicker a little bit sometimes. When you're surrounded by people that curse, it's easier for a bad word to slip out of your mouth. When you're surrounded by people that consume alcohol, it's harder for you to turn down a drink when it's offered to you. If you work in a school or an office where everybody around you is cheating to get ahead, it's tempting for you to not fall behind, so maybe you'll take a shortcut. There were people living like that. It's called peer pressure. And peer pressure can affect even good folks. We live in a pagan world. And we need to remember that we're not supposed to follow their influence. We're supposed to be living a life that's so attractive that they'll want to follow our influence. Second reason that we fail to live godly lives is some people confuse good doctrine with good Christianity. I know a lot of people that know a lot about the Word. Uh, They know all the doctrine. They've got the right teaching, but they're not living the right lives. Uh, You can be the number one graduate in the Bible preaching school at Freed Hardeman or Memphis School of Preaching. You can know every single detail. You can memorize the entire Bible, but if it doesn't change the way you live, then it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, there are Christians that are like that. They got all their ducks in the row. They know all the right answers, but they don't live that way. I've been in elders' meetings where the elders and the preacher weren't seeing eye to eye. Uh, there was one situation, one of the first elders' meetings I ever went to, uh, the preacher and one of the elders were into it. 
They weren't getting along. And one of the other elders said, right now, we need to fire the preacher and ask this other elder to step down because they're not living Christian lives. They're not setting Christian examples. And he was right. But they didn't. Uh, now, in this case, the preacher had this doctrine right. He was right scripturally, but he wasn't living an example of Christianity. He wasn't being loving. He wasn't being kind. In fact, we had hundreds and hundreds of members in this church, but there were several hundred that didn't agree with the preacher. He just said, they all go somewhere else. He didn't want to try to reason with them. He didn't want to show them their error. He just didn't want to have to deal with them. That's not what being a Christian is supposed to be about. Sound doctrine should result in godly living. Uh, Paul told Titus in chapter 2, verse 1, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. In other words, he's saying live out your life in a way that it shows people how they're supposed to live. Uh, verse 5 says that sound doctrine should make people live in such a way that the word of God be not blasphemed. What's that saying is, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, then when people say, oh, you're a Christian, then we need to be living a life that reflects Jesus. Because if we're not living a life that reflects Christ, and we're calling ourselves Christians, Paul says, that's blasphemy. You're talking bad about Jesus if you're living a life that's not honoring him and calling yourself a follower of Christ. And we forget that sometimes. And there are churches all across the country that had been damaged because somebody that had the right doctrine didn't have the right example, didn't have the right heart, and he split the church. Uh, now, if you don't live sound doctrine, then you don't really have sound doctrine. If you're not living a life according to Jesus, then it doesn't matter if you know what he said to do, you're not doing it. Now, we can all think of people that were like that, but this is not a game of tag. We're not looking for people to point out the ones that are not doing right. The point is, we need to be doing right. We need to be living right. Paul told Titus in Titus 1 verse 13 that he was to rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Paul says, Titus, if you find people that are not living right, if they're not being a good example for Christ, go to them and tell them. Tell them they need to change so that they can be a good example, so that they'll be sound in their faith. The, example, the, the goal here is holiness. Holiness is the objective. You want those people to be holy. The only way you can do that is for you to be holy. But what is holiness? What does it mean to be holy? Well, back in 2006, the Barna Researcher Group uh, asked people about holiness. They went to all these different people in churches and says, what does it mean to be holy and everybody talks about holiness, but not many people knew what holiness was. Only one out of four people that they surveyed said that they thought that they were holy. And when they asked them what holiness means, what's the definition of holiness, the number one answer was, I don't know. Well, there are a lot of theologians that will teach you that holiness has to do with something about religion and how you live your life religiously. But that's not what holy really means. The word holy literally means set apart. Set apart. Uh, for example, when Mark was leading the singing up here this morning, he was set apart from the rest of the congregation. His job was to be up here, and he was separated from the rest of the, the body. When Brother Johnny read the lesson before Sunday school, he was set apart. He was not part of the congregation. He was separated to do his work. That's what set apart means. That means holy, literally. Mark and Johnny were both holy this morning because they were separated from everybody else. That's what holy literally means. But when we're set apart because of God, it's a deeper meaning than that because God has set us apart from the rest of the world. He set us apart because we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be separated from the world. We're not supposed to be living the way the world is living. He's called us to be holy, to be separate, to be called out, to be different because he's got a better plan for us. And our holiness is to result in eternal life. And because of that, he wants us to set an example. Look at Titus 3, verse 3. Paul writes, For we ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, 
living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul says, that's how we used to live. We used to be like that, but we're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be separate. We're supposed to be different. Look what happened in verse four. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God wants us to be different. God wants us to be separate. God wants us to be holy. And he gave us an opportunity to do that by sending Jesus. See, when we're saved, God's grace steps in and teaches us that we're not supposed to be living the way we used to live. We're not supposed to be setting the same example that we used to set. We're supposed to be saying no more and more to things that we used to be saying yes to. Uh, and then he shows us how good it feels to be different. Uh, one example I saw was a guy that quit smoking. They asked him how he was doing. He says, oh, it's great. He said, I feel better now when I feel bad than I used to feel when I felt good. Okay? That's what being a Christian should feel like. We have bad days. They still should be better than our good days were before we came to know Jesus Christ. That's what God's grace should be doing in our life. It should be making us feel better than we used to feel. Now, there's something else that's involved with that. If you remember what we read in the text a minute ago, uh, Paul said that Titus needed to tell the older men to behave themselves, and he told the younger men to behave themselves. But then he started talking to the older women, and it seems like Paul was picking on the older women. Uh, there are a lot of people that say Paul was a misogynist and that Paul couldn't really been inspired because he felt so badly about women. That's not really what Paul was teaching here. Go back to Titus 2, verse 3. Paul told Titus to tell the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Why do the older women have so much more instruction than the older men or the younger men? Well, Paul wasn't picking on them. He was telling them that they had a special purpose. They had a special role. They had something that was very important that they needed to be doing. Back before our scripture reading, uh, in Titus chapter 1, Paul is talking about the qualifications for elders. Uh, Titus 1 verse 9, Paul says that elders should be holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, to convince the gainsayers. That's kind of what Paul's telling the older women that they need to be doing. They need to be setting an example. They need to be reaching out to these younger women. They have a responsibility to train the younger women. Here's the point. One of the tools that God gives us for being holy, for being set apart, is we have each other. We're supposed to be helping each other. We're supposed to encourage each other. We're supposed to be lifting each other up. That's what fellowship is all about because holiness is hard to do. It's hard to be different if you're doing it all by yourself. That's why we need to be uplifting and building each other up. That's what the Hebrew writer was talking about in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24. He wrote, And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And Paul says that some people have specific jobs. The elders have a specific job, and the older women have specific jobs. All of us should be exhorting each other, encouraging each other, building each other up. And that's why it's important that we have things like Bible class and Sunday school and we go to gospel meetings and vacation Bible schools and all the other opportunities that we have to share time with God's people. That's why it's hard sometimes when we have a small congregation such as this uh, to have opportunities for fellowship that we need to encourage us, to build us up, to make us feel better about being holy. Now, I didn't say we need to be holier than that. Okay, we're supposed to be different, but the objective is not to be better than everybody else or to be more righteous than the next guy. It's to be better than we used to be. 
It's not about making us feel better about ourselves. Paul wrote in Titus 2.10, uh, the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. That's what we're supposed to be wearing. We're supposed to be putting on Jesus. So when other people look at us, they see Him. We're supposed to be setting that example. I read an illustration. There's a writer named Paul Thigpen. Paul Thigpen had a friend that had gone to Yale. Uh, his friend was a very smart young man. He was also very athletic. He became captain of the Yale football team. But he was a devout Christian, and he didn't always do the things that the other football players did. And it was a tradition at Yale that the captain of the team was inducted into this secret society. But this secret society was known for their immorality. They did a lot of things that, that you shouldn't do. And this young man realized that, and he refused to be inducted into the society. And it became a big question on the campus because everybody knew he was supposed to be. Why wasn't he? And it gave him an opportunity to tell everybody why he didn't. They said that the seed was planted all across Yale's campus. Thigpen went on to write this. People notice the co-worker who leaves the room whenever the conversation turns to gossip or inappropriate jokes. They respect the person at the office party who politely refuses liquor and still has a good time. Such small but visible acts of integrity born of faith often prompt curious inquiries. People want to know, why don't you do the things everybody else does? Because we're holy. Because we've been called apart. Because we're not supposed to be like everybody else is. This lesson hadn't been about the gospel plan of salvation. Uh, however, in order to be holy, in order to be set apart for God, you need to be a Christian. The only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. This lesson's been for all of us that have already put on Christ in baptism. We've already accepted the gospel. We're supposed to be living as Christians. The message is we need to live like Christians. We need to be followers of Christ. We haven't been doing that. We need to make some changes. If you need to make a public change this morning, you can do it right now. So we stand together as we sing.